Good evening, everybody. Welcome. My name is Peter Steves, and it's my privilege to be the director of the DePaul Humanities Center. And I'm pleased to welcome you to the second installment in our Year of Scale series, as tonight we celebrate the 50th anniversary of Woodstock. <laughs> Woo, indeed, indeed. We first begin, though, as we always begin here at the Humanities Center, by acknowledging the traditional territory upon which we gather this evening. So long before Europeans arrived, varied and numerous native people sought to walk gently on this land. They offered assistance to the first European travelers to this territory, sharing their knowledge for survival and living a good life. Among others, the Potawatomi, Ojibwe, Miami, and Illinois inhabited what is now this part of Chicago. While we here today have no power to honor the treaties that were signed, we do recognize that these treaties were brokered under some duress and deception. So it's our hope tonight to honor the good faith with which the native people of the region entered into these treaties. As Potawatomi Chief Matea is purported to have said at the signing of the 1821 Treaty of Chicago, quote, this is a small piece of land. If we give it away, what will become of us? The great spirit who has provided it for our use allows us to keep it. We should incur his anger if we bartered it away. If we had more land, you should get more. But our land has been wasting away ever since the white people became our neighbors. We now have hardly enough left to cover the bones of our tribe. In solidarity with Chief Matea, we recognize the history and legacy of this subjugation, as well as the enduring presence today of Native Americans among our faculty, staff, student body, and community. And it's thus that we seek a new relationship with the original peoples of this land, one based on true respect, as we also reaffirm our general and driving dedication to finding ways both institutionally and personally for the work that we do at the DePaul Humanity Center to be a model of what it means to be dedicated to making our society a more enlightened and just place for everyone in our community. Oh, thank you. So it will soon be my honor to introduce to you our three special guests and all of the talented performers this evening. But before that, I thought we might take a few minutes to remember and think together about that music and art festival that took place 50 years ago that brings us all together tonight. So what's in a name? We sometimes forget the various names, the official names for Woodstock. It was in fact known as a music and art fair, but also as an Aquarian exposition and as three days of peace and music. These monikers are telling, I think, in that the intent of Woodstock was to be more than merely a concert. Or perhaps to put it better, it was to point out that no concert is ever merely a concert if we go about it the right way. Woodstock, from the very start, was poised to be a moment when music and culture could come together to expose the intricate feedback loop they have in creating each other to inspire an audience to imagine an alternate reality. And I don't mean a drug-induced, altered reality, but an alternate reality, one that could run counter to the main culture, a reality in which the folk music that was driven by politics, the rock music driven by questioning and rebelling against authority, might come together and, simply by hanging in the ether above a dairy farm, inform the ethos of a weekend such that a different way to be together a different way to have a culture might be demonstrated. The squares back in 69 never got it. Without even taking into consideration what journalists on the scene were actually reporting as a peaceful and uplifting event, the New York Times, in an editorial entitled Nightmare in the Catskills, immediately rushed to call Woodstock a colossal mess and wondered what kind of people could create such a travesty. The dreams of marijuana and rock music, wrote the Times, that drew hippies to the Catskills had little more sanity than the impulses that drive the lemmings to march to their deaths in the sea. They ended in a nightmare of mud and stagnation. Now, these days, the culture has shifted enough that few would dare rail against unambitious hippies and their sense of entitlement, ruining everything. Older people now tend to focus their unfounded animosity on those unambitious millennials with a sense of entitlement who are ruining everything. But even if that sort of assessment of Woodstock is a messy, as a messy, worthless pit of stagnation has gone away, we have to admit that it's still in vogue to put down Woodstock in terms of what it accomplished. It's thus that 50 years later, the New York Times still feels comfortable running an article written by its chief music critic and attendee at the original Woodstock, John Perellis, that in its subheadline called the festival, in retrospect, 
and indulgence. Perlis goes on to suggest that it was a concert of uneven stage performances, and an experiment that only sort of worked by sheer luck. If passing out free food to hundreds of thousands of people proved anything, he argues it merely proved people like free stuff, and abundance was to be taken for granted, since, quote, Woodstock represented baby boomer privilege in crystalline form, end quote. He even goes on to compare the shambles in which the baby boomers left Yazger's farm to the current global warming crisis that they have supposedly left for others to clean up. Ultimately, he writes, Woodstock's ideals didn't pan out, with the boomers becoming a sales demographic rather than a political force, then they left upstate New York. So I don't say all this to pick specifically on the times. The sentiment that Woodstock didn't ultimately mean anything is common today even during this last summer when everybody was talking about the big anniversary. No one less than Joan Baez herself recently put down Woodstock as nothing but a selfish joy festival, she said, because it didn't risk anything and thus didn't lead to political revolution. So, cards on the table. I'm all for the revolution. Personally, I would argue for something that's radical in terms of its change even, without a revolutionary commitment to community, to caring for each other, not only to working outside the system, but replacing the system altogether. I fear we are doomed. And clearly, Woodstock didn't bring that about. But I'd like to take these moments tonight to think about these claims that it was therefore a failure, because I think this is far from the truth. Woodstock was a success. It was important and it still has a lot to teach us. So let me start to make this case with a topic that's somewhat esoteric, but will promptly get to the heart of the matter, I hope. The first thing that I think we can champion about Woodstock is that it was perhaps where modern irony was born. That attitude that would go on to be the main mode of discourse for Generation X, the children of the baby boomers. And irony is a gift, I think. With thanks and out of respect to Rob Leonard, our master of linguistics tonight, perhaps it'd be worth looking at how the word irony functions in the English language. It's often misunderstood. It's taken to be something that's negative. But the ancient Greek root of the word is ironic itself, since even its own definition withholds part of its meaning. In philosophy, we sometimes speak of Socratic irony, because Socrates would often claim ignorance about some topic in order to get a discussion going about it. I am the least wise person in Athens, he would say. I have no idea, for example, what love really is. Does anybody have any thoughts? But to say that this is feigning of ignorance is to fail to realize that Socrates was not trying to fool his audience. He was not practicing false modesty. Instead, he believed that the truth of the matter could only possibly show itself in dialogue, in a back and forth dialectic in which the topic is discussed and analyzed. And thus, for him to have declared that he had the correct answer already in mind would have both stifled that dialectic and would have been disingenuous to his method. So, irony is not lying. Fast forward two and a half millennia, we can also say it's not like rain on your wedding day or a traffic jam when you're already late. I respect Alanis, but that's not irony, that's just bad luck. So, we could also separate it from satire because in the latter, one is attempting to stand apart from the theme being satirized and make a statement that one does not agree with it. One satirizes kings and cultures that have gone astray and are doing bad things. Irony, however, is more postmodernly complicated. Umberto Eco, in a postscript to his novel, The Name of the Rose, put it this way. It's a long quote, but I think it's a, it's a good one, so we'll read it together. I think of the postmodern attitude as that of a man who loves a very cultivated woman and knows that he cannot say to her, I love you madly, because he knows that she knows and that she knows he knows that these words have already been written by romance novelist Barbara Cartland. Still, there's a solution. He can say, as Barbara Cartland would put it, I love you madly. At this point, having avoided false innocence, having said clearly that it is no longer possible to speak innocently, he will nevertheless have said what he wanted to say to the woman, that he loves her in an age of lost innocence. Neither of the two speakers will feel innocent, both will have accepted the challenge of the past, of the already said, which cannot be eliminated. Both will consciously and with pleasure play the game of irony, but both will have succeeded once again in speaking of love. 
And so irony is itself a kind of love. It's a way to speak the truth, but to speak truth in an era in which the concept of the truth has come under question. So let me suggest then that Shah Nana's performance at Woodstock be considered an act of loving irony. Now there are those who have wondered what this group, with their 1950s harmonies and costumes and apparent time is out of joint vibe, were doing going on right before someone like Jimi Hendrix. But this is to miss the point of the performance entirely. It was not presented as a parody, but neither was it presented as straight. Robert Leonard and the other members of Sha Na Na were clearly acting, but they were not doing so to make fun of this music. Further, they're truly talented musicians. They performed really well. But all of this was being presented in an extremely complex way, almost as if it had quotes around it. As Umberto Eco might say, if the 1960s brought American innocence to a decisive end, then how could one express one's love of any part of the past culture, any music of the past, any music that was not intent on either making a political statement like Joan Baez or other folk music at Woodstock or ripping to shreds the establishment like The Who or other rock music at Woodstock, how could one say that it's still okay to like something from a time before the lost innocence? Sha Na Na found a way. They took up the music of the just past, quoted it, and created a performance that everybody could enjoy. It's true that without Sha Na Na, there would likely have been no Grease or American graffiti movies, no Happy Days or Laverne and Shirley on TV, but the truth is that even beyond launching the 1950s nostalgia movement that took hold in the 70s, Sha Na Na did something more culturally important. It's sometimes hard for us today to think about the timing of all this. As you'll hear about later tonight, Rob Leonard soloed with Sha Na Na on the song Teen Angel at Woodstock. A Teen Angel, written by Mark Dinning, was a teenage tragedy song that had come out in 1959, just 10 years before Woodstock. The music that Sha Na Na was playing was from a period only a decade old, but it already sounded to the crowd as if a huge cultural divide stood between the eras. To the audience at Woodstock, the doo-wop sound of the 50s sounded ancient. But to put it in perspective, it would really just be like me playing Single Ladies Put a Ring on It by Beyonce for you tonight, because that song came out in 2009, just 10 years ago. It was 10 years ago for us that Kanye bum-rushed the stage at the VMAs and interrupted Taylor Swift's acceptance speech, declaring Beyonce's Single Ladies as the true winner and one of the greatest videos of all time. That's the same time span between the original Teen Angel and Sha Na Na's cover of it at Woodstock. We think that our culture moves quickly today, but the 1960s, those were the years of true cultural acceleration. Sha Na Na were singing the music that their older siblings had enjoyed, the music that they themselves had grown up with, if we think, for instance, about the culture we all ingest in elementary and middle school years. And one of the things that that Woodstock brought to the fore then was the power and the use of this kind of irony. And thanks to that brilliant and lovingly ironic performance by Sha Na Na, Jimi Hendrix, who went on next and who had lobbied to get Sha Na Na an invitation to perform at Woodstock, could offer up a version of the Star Spangled Banner that was at once both a violent barrage of sound that brought the horror of Vietnam to the New York countryside and a desperate cry to his home country to be something more, something better. It could be understood, that is, within the context of irony. Not a satire of the national anthem, but a new appearance of what patriotism could mean if we were to rethink its commitments in a radical way. And, thanks to that brilliant and lovingly ironic performance by Sha Na Na, it also must have been impossible for the, con the concert goers who still remained early Monday morning to fail to see that their own performances of identity, their clothing, language, and aesthetic tastes, they were all also necessarily informed by history and would soon become history, a part of what would soon need to be quoted in order to be affirmed, which is, in essence, what we are doing here tonight. Because the reason I put this event together was not out of nostalgia. Nostalgia never really ends up being good for anyone. But in order to affirm something about Woodstock, even though most of us here tonight weren't there originally, and all of us who are here tonight are different people who live in a different time. 
Tonight, then, we quote Barbara Cartland to say, I love you madly. Tonight, we quote Woodstock to, in order to affirm something that is at its heart. So what is it, then, that deserves our affirmation? A lot of things, I think, but let's just be clear that part of the success of Woodstock, part of the reason I think we must reject that sentiment that it failed or was just a concert, is that it was real. It really happened, and it was a success. I want a better world now. I want the revolution. But we should not think that everything that fails to create lasting change is worthless. My favorite lunch is a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. But when I eat one, and I'm hungry again six hours later, I don't curse that sandwich for failing to have satiated my hunger for all eternity. It's not a bad sandwich because it didn't turn out to be infinite. It's just a reminder, it would be nice to have some more peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. So, more Woodstock then? Yes, in a sense, that's exactly right. More Woodstock. But more of what exactly? I'll give you a couple examples in closing. Consider, when the festival announcers announced, the festival organizers announced that Woodstock was now going to be a free concert after it became clear that there was no way to collect tickets because the gates and fences still had not been constructed and hundreds of thousands of people were pouring in, well, the organizers reported that rather than being overcome with panic, they felt a strange calm. Woodstock, after all, had been started as a capitalist enterprise. Yes, it had good social ideas and good vibes behind it, but it was part of the system, part of an attempt to make profit. Yet, it turned into something else. And what turned it into something better was both the sheer number of people who participated and the way that they behaved when they were together. Their peaceful attendance, their occupation, took what was a capitalist enterprise and transformed it. And it still exists today in our culture as something much bigger and better. This then is a major positive lesson. What starts out as a profit-seeking business might become something better, perhaps in even a culture or even a country. Over the next three days, the fact that Woodstock was an art fair, that it was a celebration of peace, all of this came to the fore. Hugh Romney, better known as Wavy Gravy, was part of the Hog Forum Commune, the group hired by the concert organizers to head up security. They started what was called a police force, rather than a police force. Wavy was the police chief. Instead of yelling, do this, at people, he would say with a smile, would it be okay if maybe we all did this? Hey, what do you think? The 85 members of the Hog Forum were brought to upstate New York on a jet, but they weren't paid a penny to do this job. They just thought they could be useful and they wanted to help. They not only peacefully kept the peace, but the Hog Farm Commune also set up trip tents, where they stayed with people who were having bad reactions to drugs, encouraging them not to take antipsychotic or tranquilizer drugs, such as Thorazine, as a treatment, but instead to engage in physical proximity and conversation with someone who could reassure them and be with them as they were trying to deal with it all. They treated nearly 800 people over the three days of the festival. Once patients got better, the hog farmers would say, see your brother or sister coming through the door now in a mess? That was you three hours ago, so stay here, help him or her. And scores of people did. The trip tent talk therapy was so effective that the medical professionals who were on site began just sending those on a bad trip to the hog farmers, eventually even adopting those methods themselves. There were two deaths at Woodstock over the festival days. A teenager from New Jersey was killed by a tractor driver who didn't see him sleeping on the ground. And a Marine from Long Island died after the festival closed, having earlier been taken to the hospital, possibly suffering from a heroin overdose. We don't know for sure. Though both are sad cases, it is important to remember that the event itself was indeed peaceful. For comparison, the city of Buffalo, New York, had about the same population as the entire Woodstock crowd, something around 450,000. And Buffalo registered 40 deaths over the same weekend, including homicides. At Woodstock, there wasn't a single recorded fight, no knife wounds from a stabbing, no black eyes from a thrown punch, not a single person who was officially treated for an injury inflicted intentionally by another person. On Saturday, amidst the sound of Country Joe McDonald protesting the war in Vietnam and singing how we're all fixing to die, those behind the scenes realized they were about to run out of food. 
as in no food for anyone at any concession stand anywhere. This was obviously a major crisis, but something amazing soon took place to solve that problem. The people of nearby White Lake and Bethel, the civilians, the non-concert goers, the residents came to the rescue. They cooked food, made sandwiches, emptied their pantries, cleaned out their kitchens, and had everything collected to be airlifted to the festival grounds. Local farm farmers donated eggs, hundreds of thousands of hard-boiled eggs. The hog farm set up a kitchen on site. They made thousands of pounds of brown rice and vegetables, then dispensed it all for free. One resident, an older woman who lived in Bethel, said, we may be hicks, but the Bible said, feed the hungry and welcome the stranger, and we did. It was a beautiful enactment, in fact, of the miracle of the loaves and the fishes. Because what that Bible story means is not that Jesus can do crazy magic and make fish appear out of nowhere. It's not properly a story of supernatural abilities, but a story about ethics and politics. The Bible in that story is saying that we are called on to feed people even when it seems impossible to do so. If there are hungry people around you, even if it seems hopeless, figure out a way to feed them. That's what was done at Woodstock. It's what we should be doing now. Sunday morning, the hog farmers began preparing breakfast in bed for more than 400,000 people. They made oatmeal with raisins, nuts, and fruits. Max Yasker contributed milk and yogurt to the oatmeal, tens of thousands of pounds of dairy that he decided to donate, on top of having already cheaply leased 600 acres of his farm as a location for the concert. Knowing that it would likely bring a crowd of young people who were light years away from his own political and cultural beliefs even, a self-proclaimed conservative Republican, Max asked if he could address the crowd. I'm a farmer. I don't know. I don't know how to speak to 20 people at one time, let alone a crowd like this. But I think you people have proven something to the world. Not only to town of Bethel or Sullivan County or New York State, you've proven something to the world. This is the largest group of people ever assembled in one place. We have had no idea that there would be this size group. And because of that, you had quite a few inconveniences as far as water and food and so forth. Your producers have done a mammoth job to see that you're taken care of. They enjoy a vote of thanks. But above that, the important thing that you've proven to the world is that a half a million kids, and I call you kids because I have children now older than you are, a half a million young people can get together and have three days of fun and music and have nothing but fun and music, and I got pleasure for it. That Vietnam draft was a dark part of the spirit of the times a palpable threat that hung in the air, especially for the average young person who was at Woodstock. And the spirit of the festival was all about peace, an end to the war, it's true, but also something even deeper. As was modeled by the police force and the hog farm commune members and all of the people who donated food and nearly half a million humans that celebrated something special together over those three days, simply being together peacefully, the sentiment at Woodstock was definitely anti-war. But it was also anti-something else. It was about demonstrating that a culture can run counter to our mainstream culture and offer a true alternative. And that's an important lesson for today that needs and deserves to be celebrated because our young people, indeed all of us, are still under the threat of the draft. We are being drafted into this society, this civilization, this current way of life each and every day. This is the draft that is the engine of mainstream culture itself, the power of enculturation that takes our children and turns them into what the man wants them to be, workers, consumers, destroyers, winners or losers, slaves or enslavers, but all still players in a game that is itself the very problem. 
As the draft to send young men off to kill and die in Vietnam raged in 1969, so today we are, each of us, conscripted into a violent and immoral struggle. We are asked to take part in a war on the planet Earth, on the very home beneath our feet. They don't put an M16 in our hands and ship us across the ocean, but they do put a Big Mac in our mouths, a disposable bottle of water within reach, and a plastic bag to carry it all around in. We are at war against our very future, against our children, against the animals and plants. We're at war against our neighbors, letting the institutions of the oppressor pretend that they can solve our communal problems, when, as it was clear in Vietnam, we all know we're being fed a lie. Our technology doesn't really bring us together, but only serves to drive us further apart. Prisons don't bring about justice. Schools don't bring about wisdom. Pharmaceutical companies and HMOs don't bring about health. Even our neoliberal democracy doesn't bring about the common good. The culture drafts us into thinking that there's only one way to live, only one way to be free, only one way to find happiness. And as a result, we buy into that vision, pick up metaphorical arms, and give up the best years of our life to classrooms, to our jobs, to a world in which, as Neil Young once put it, lives become careers, an existence of continual fear, as Stephen Stills once added, where you step out of the line, the man will come and take you away. Music is what a culture dreams. It bubbles up from a collective unconscious, a pastiche of all we've been through so far, but also all we might aspire to be. It manifests overnight, and in the morning, we sometimes struggle to remember it, but we can always hear its echoes if we listen carefully. Woodstock wasn't perfect, but I don't expect or want a perfect Woodstock. Perfection is stagnation. Creating a world in which there's social and economic justice, in which difference isn't merely tolerated, but our freak flags fly higher and higher, this will always take constant attention, commitment, and care. Of course, I can't speak for anyone else here tonight, but to me, that is the lesson of Woodstock, or at least one of its lessons. For a moment, a great truth was revealed. Music, art, fun, Peace, love, resistance, and community were all shown to be different manifestations of the same thing, the same driving force. It is a truth that we ignore at our peril. It is a truth worth celebrating. And so, welcome to our celebration of the 50th anniversary of Woodstock. And we begin in earnest now, and we start off with a great band playing a great song. Joan Baez originally sang Joe Hill at uh, Woodstock, a song about a real man by the same name who was a labor organizer and a champion of the poor and the working class. Joe was framed for murder in 1915 and executed by the state that same year, but you can't keep a good man down. So here with their version of Joe Hill, please welcome Sunshine Boys. Oh, 
That's the way to start things off. Excellent. Up next, we have um, a song that was written by Robbie Robertson and performed by the band at Woodstock. Please join me in welcoming Mercedes Webb to play The Weight. Really cool that I got to play this. Um, he passed away about five years ago, and uh, so this is really special and goes out to him. His name is Ken. Um, Thank you. 
got one more musical performance for you before the next, uh, for the first lecture, really. Um, this is a song that Bob Dylan had written in 1968, so just one year before Woodstock, and then it's like everybody who played Woodstock covered this song. Uh, Joan Baez, Joe Cocker, the band, they all did a version, and we're lucky tonight to have a version by Alec Baird. Please welcome Alec.
That's beautiful, Alec. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm very pleased indeed to introduce our first speaker this evening. Robert Leonard is professor of linguistics, director of the graduate program in forensic linguistics, and director of the Institute for Forensic Linguistics, Threat Assessment, and Strategic Analysis at Hofstra University. He is also one of the founders of Shana Na. Rob is the only person I know, perhaps could even imagine, who took the opposite path that most of us in academia dream of taking and still made it look extremely cool. Speaking at least for myself, though I know I'm not alone in this, I would in a heartbeat give up being a professor to be a rock star. And Rob Leonard did the opposite. But maybe he looks at, makes it look so cool because he's basically still a rock star of academia. As a specialist in forensic linguistics, he's qualified as an expert witness in linguistics in 12 states and six federal district courts. Maybe you've seen him on TV in forensic files or testifying as part of the Jean Benet Ramsey investigation. He is, after all, considered one of the greatest language detectives in the world, or as the New Yorker referred to him, the Sam Spade of semantics. Rob is the man who the FBI's Behavioral Analysis Unit called up to train their agents at Quantico. And he's worked with the NYPD Hate Crimes Task Force, British Law Enforcement, the Prime Minister of Canada, the list goes on. The work he does today in linguistics and the skills he possesses have indeed made him internationally renowned. If there were a Woodstock of academics, God knows there should be, Rob would once again be a headliner. So while all of this is true, it is not Rob's incredible language sleuthing abilities that mainly bring him here to be with us tonight, though we'd be lucky to have him back another time to talk just about that. Instead, it's the fact that while an undergraduate at Columbia University, Rob started Sha Na Na, saying bass in the group and soloed at Woodstock. So, please join me in welcoming to the stage a man who drank with Janis Joplin, hung out with the Grateful Dead, opened for Jimi Hendrix, and could, if he wanted, tell us stories about all of that in perfect French, Spanish, Swahili, Thai, Arabic, and any number of languages you've never heard of, Professor Robert Leonard.
That's a really hard act to follow, I must say. Um, thank you very much. I must say I was really impressed with your take on us and on Woodstock. For 50 years, I have been listening to descriptions and saying them myself of Woodstock, and I think yours is the best, or as we would say in the old days, the most right on. But really, uh, I take my hat off to you. So I started as a college junior in a small college singing group. These days would be an a cappella group and we loved the 50s music, even though we we're a little too uh, young for it. Uh, I'm a second bass, and uh, there's a lot of good second bass stuff in doo-wop. And it's a long story, but uh, in 1968, a year before Woodstock, there was violence everywhere. Um, there was the Vietnam War. I lost 25 guys that I was a senior with to Vietnam for no reason. Uh, McNamara, the Secretary of Defense, later on uh, admitted that they had simply lied and made things up. 25 of my friends died for nothing. Another thing that unified everybody, I think, at Woodstock, too, because it was universal draft, although I like your version of what the draft means. Anyway, in 1968, all over the world, for example, France, uh, there were student uprisings and sometimes uh, in league with workers. And at Columbia, the students violently, I have to admit, took over the campus, uh, detained the dean, took over the president's uh, office. The president there had been so distant from the students, he had a man go, I think it was, uh, there that he used to boast no student had ever seen. A couple of days later, the police rather violently took it back. The student body was tremendously at odds with itself. Uh, there were what were known as the pukes and the jocks, and there would be fistfights. This was the left and the rightists. And the next year, my brother, George Leonard, had the idea of, because he knew we loved these 50 songs and he'd heard them uh, sang, sung by us, he said, I have an idea. And, and in short, what it was was a pre-violent Eden, a make-believe version of the 1950s, which was hardly violent or anything like Eden, but it's the 50s that we know now from Greece, and my group was in Greece. We were the band at the, in the, uh, uh, school dance. I was on my Fulbright in uh, northern Kenya at that point. But my brother said, call the boys to your apartment, Rob. So I did. I was the leader of the group. And he looked at us all and he said, boys, I'm going to make you rock and roll stars. And of course we said, yeah, sure. Five months later, I'm sitting with Jimi Hendrix, who's showing me how to drink uh, um, tequila with the salt and the lime. Uh, in the most insider nightclub in New York City, Steve Paul's The Scene. It was so insider that it doesn't even have a Wikipedia page to this day. It was half owned by Andy Warhol, who really appreciated how avant-garde we were. As a matter of fact, one of the things I'm most proud about is um, Frank Zappa called us the freakiest group he'd ever seen. <laughs> so I'm sitting there with Jimi Hendrix, and I'd met Janice the night before, and Jimmy's saying how much he likes us, and I said, holy Jesus, my brother was right. <laughs> so very soon after, we got booked into uh, Woodstock, and we assume it was Jimmy. We, we are not even in the, uh, we were a real late entry. Mike Lang came to see us. I thought he was just another stoned hippie. I tried to gently throw him out of the, uh, dressing room, luckily I didn't, before our manager, another 23-year-old, grabbed us. And good thing I didn't, because that night, organized crime closed the scene forever with tear gas and violence and everything, So, and it never reopened. Anyway, so uh, that's me second to the left, if you couldn't figure it out. And uh, let's see what the, oh, so okay, so we got booked into Woodstock, and we go to Woodstock, and here we are. Was it you were looking for? Like, what are we getting into? Yeah. That 
Peter is quite right that we were acting in, in the true sense of it. For example, every single movement, every expression on my face, every article of clothing that we were wearing was choreographed and scripted by my brother George, uh, who was a real genius, I must say, and has gone on to write uh, many novels uh, that sold to Hollywood and everything, and is uh, also a professor, right? I mean, you know, of, uh, of English. So, um, I really, really liked the rock world. Um, as I said, we played with everybody in the world. I, I always say nowadays that I'm one of the few people who has worked with both the FBI and the Grateful Dead. 
Um, and these days, the FBI is looking about as radical as uh, the Grateful Dead, and that's a great thing, I think. Um, but uh, all good things must come to an end, and after a couple of years, uh, I decided, well, Columbia offered me a full ride to the PhD, and as much fun as I was having, it was also a very painful time. Our own lead guitarist would soon die of a heroin overdose. Uh, Jimmy died. Janice, who I used to drink with all the time at the Fillmore West, died. And, you know, whenever you're inside a business, especially the music business, you see it isn't the beautiful, glittering thing that you might have thought. And that's what I kept telling myself anyway, and I decided to quit, and I did. And I went back to Columbia, and I got my PhD. Oh, I forgot. So the only language that was not given Monday through Friday was, of course, I mean, if you look at me, you know what language it was, because it's a language that I'm the teacher of, and it's Swahili, an East African Bantu language with a tremendously complicated grammatical system. It has the equivalent, if it were Spanish or French, it would have 13 genders. Yeah, three of which have to do with different aspects of space and time. It's just fabulous. So I took it. And uh, then when I went to graduate school, I specialized in it. And at the end, I said, gee, why don't I try to go? And I went on a one-year Fulbright, and I stayed there six, seven years. I went to Southeast Asia. I studied Thai. And uh, people always said to me, well, what was it like being a rock star? And I said, well, if you want to know the truth, this is more fun. Really, it was. Try it, guys. So. Then I went back to the US, I went to Hofstra University, where I am now, uh, and I began forensic linguistics. I was adopted, so to speak, by uh, Roger Shai, who was a uh, distinguished research professor emeritus at Georgetown, and who really founded forensic linguistics. And we'll be talking about what that is in a second, we'll pivot. Um, and I became his partner in research and in cases, and I worked 100 cases with him. And I was uh, asked by the Pennsylvania State Police to work on a murder case where a woman had gotten a threatening letter, she had been strangled, and then um, other letters were sent by a self-confessed serial killer claiming that he had done it, not their chief suspect. And there's a, a very good forensic file, it's called A Tight Leash, on that. Um, so at that point, I met a lot of FBI agents, and I was invited to go to Quantico to help train the behavioral analysis units, uh, units, uh, forensic linguistics people, and we had week-long uh, boot camps for people from all over the world and, and those agents by Jim Fitzgerald, who was head of the forensic linguistics uh, program at uh, the FBI and who had worked on the Unabomber case and had shown the utility of forensic linguistics to the FBI. And then I did a lot of training with him. I trained MI5 and MI6 before the um, London Olympics uh, in our methods of uh, threat assessment and counterterrorism using language analysis and I recruited Jim to come and we did that together. And, uh, this was our mantra, and it can solve and prevent and undo crimes, too, as we'll see. So this is what forensic linguistics does. We gain maximum intelligence from language evidence. And language evidence is miserably analyzed in our uh, jurisprudence system. That's why there are so many false confessions. Uh, a, a tremendous number of people who've been exonerated by the Innocence Project, the Innocence Project, guys that I work with with my own Innocence Project, have confessed because they were false confessions. <sighs> Every time you sit down at a keyboard or open your mouth to speak, you are giving away a lot more information about yourself than you can imagine, and it's that kind of information that we sometimes are able to use for example, in bomb cases or uh, kidnappings. So these are some of the kinds of cases that I started doing with Roger and then um, doing uh, now with my own teams. And at Hofstra, we started a graduate program in this, the only one in the Western Hemisphere. And my student interns, who we'll see in another second, 
work on active cases of exoneration and sometimes uh, investigation for prosecution. We are tracking a serial killer through the Carolinas for the entire last year helping investigators. Somebody who kept killing people and there was one uh, suicide note that was left and, and staging their deaths as suicides. And there was one suicide note that we were able to almost, well, very convincingly analyze having been written by that person and not the person who was deceased. So as I write, to come full circle, my students today, with the same hopes as the Woodstock generation for justice and equality, work with me in a very, very one-of-a-kind forensic linguistics capital case death penalty innocence project at Hofstra University. And it was started when I got a call from an inmate in a prison here in the Chicago area who'd been in jail for 20 years already. And he had been put in largely on a confession, which turns out he didn't write. But for 20 years, nobody believed him. So the man's Antoine Cuby just spoke to him the other day. He, he, now he, he was 18, now he has a, a grandson. Um, accused of armed robbery and murder. Crucial evidence was a signed confession. The police said that he dictated and they typed. And Cuby was sentenced to life in prison. If he hadn't been 18, they probably would have executed him. So Antoine claims that he was interrogated and beaten. And at this point in time in Chicago, unfortunately, there, were, there was a lot of um, torture. Uh, people had come back from Vietnam knowing how to torture people. And there were court cases on this. It was a big scandal uh, back around 25, 26 years ago. So he signed a form for a phone call. And the next time he saw those forms, there was this long confession. And here it is. And the authorship, therefore, is questioned. So. For linguists in the audience, if uh, there are any, and I'm sure there are, uh, various things like complementizer deletion, contraction patterns, et cetera, we analyzed, my students and I, and showed that we had contemporaneous writings of Cubies uh, to his aunt and to his girlfriend at the time, and nothing matched. Nothing matched. The features in the confession did not appear in Cubies' known writings. But a bunch of them did appear in the speech patterns of the officer who testified against him. Now sometimes, and I work for prosecution a lot, and I work a lot with the police, and I work with the FBI, uh, there can be valid confessions where the defendant says, or the suspect at that point, you know, help me fill in things, you see? And then you'll have a mixture of language. But here, the police claimed that they took down each and every word of what he said with none of their own input, and that simply cannot be true. This is seven years ago, unfortunately. Now, I told you that QB was tortured, and, well, so I went to our law school. There's a famous um, constitutional law professor, Eric Friedman, and I said to him, uh, you're an expert on appeals, how can I help QB? Uh, typically, we don't get involved and try to be proponents for people, but uh, this is a special case. And he said, look, Rob, I know you want to help the cause of justice. I do, too. But QB has expended all his appeals in the 20 years he's been in jail, and he just doesn't have any more left. But it turned out he did because he was tortured. And the state of Illinois passed a law that said if you had been tortured by these guys, then you had more appeals. So this is the Torture Inquiry and Relief Commission. And I've been dealing with them, but again, for several years. But uh, there's a lot of rays of hope. And uh, QB's uh, co-defendant, who's just served 20 years, 
of a 40-year um, sentence has come out and said that QB didn't do it. He did. So hopefully this will tip the scales. But the, uh, I imagine the doors would just swing open, and they certainly haven't. But we're also working on a lot of other cases, and so are a lot of other people uh, all over the country. So there's a lot of hope for that. Thank you very much. That's fantastic, Rob. Thank you for sharing that with us. Incredible stories. So our second Joan Baez song of the night, a beautiful one that Joan wrote for her sister and her soon-to-be brother-in-law. This is Sweet Sir Galahad, and we're pleased to have Aaron Hogan here. Please help me welcome Aaron. junior in college and I can't even imagine you know what your life is like and now you live this like prolific life so you were a great singer <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah I'm an opera major here at DePaul University School of Music and I'm, I'm happy to be here tonight Ooh. Sweet Sir Galahad came in through the window in the night when the moon was in the yard. He took her hand in his and shook the long hair from his neck and he told her she'd been working much too hard. It was true that ever since the day a crazy man had passed away to the land of poets' pride. She laughed and talked a lot with new people on the block, and always in the evening time she cried. And tears to the dawn of their days. La, 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 la. Of their days. 
put it that up there with Joan's version any day. Thank you so much, Aaron. That was beautiful. So I've just been past this message backstage from Edward Chip Monk, the Master of Ceremonies. I'll just read it for you here. To get to the warning I've received, you may take it with however many grains of salt you wish, the brown lollipops that were circulated at the front desk are not specifically too good. It's suggested you stay away from them. Of course, it's your diabetes trip, but please be advised there's a warning on that one, okay? Stay away from the brown lollipops. Speaking of which, it's time to get psychedelic with Lewis Carroll and the Jefferson Airplane. Please welcome Gretchen Malich performing White Rabbit. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Gretchen. That was amazing. Our next speaker is Ellen Sander. <laughs> there we go. London Bridge has fallen on Ellen Sander. Um, now, Ellen is not only a talented poet, journalist, and music critic, she's also something of a zealot character in rock and roll. Name an historical moment in rock history, and odds are that Ellen was there. Dylan goes electric at Newport? Check. John and Yoko climb into bed for peace? Mm-hmm. In the studio with the Rolling Stones as they record a Beggar's Banquet? She was there. Arguing with Abby Hoffman on stage at Woodstock just as the Who are about to play? That was Ellen. It's a remarkable life, to be sure, but part of Ellen's talent is the way that she recounts it in her excellent writing makes it seem just so matter-of-fact. Without a trace of false modesty, she tells these stories, and you feel as if she's still one of us, as if we could have been there too, forgetting for the moment just how nearly impossible it would be for you or I to have had a one-on-one -on -one conversation with Mick Jagger, breakfast with Eric Burden, an afternoon with Mama Cass, a long friendship with David Crosby. Just how unlucky it would be that you or I could ever write a sentence such as, quote, Chuck Berry was dating a friend of mine. 
Diane Gardner. Diane and I had plans for the evening. She lived downstairs from Jim Morrison, who was peeling the fender off his girlfriend's car off the side of the too narrow driveway as I arrived. It takes a bit of luck, perhaps, to have a life where you're in the midst of the hippest movers and shakers of the time, but it takes talent, hard work, and depth of character to be able to chronicle that life in flowing prose and metaphor, all with an air of inclusiveness and generosity that invites us to imagine we might have been there too, even while we learn from Ellen's words that music means far more than what we might thought it meant in the first. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Ellen Sander. Thank you, Peter, for that beautiful introduction. And let me do this. Was a matter of time, that's about time, was the summer of 69. And time went by like a multicolored film and the sound of rock and pop and cheers. And no one's heard before cheers you could hear for miles and miles and miles. And Joan Baez with a belly full of baby, sweet Sebastian and incredible strings, Richie Havens chants freedom, freedom, freedom. Going up the country and country Joe and the dead was live, making five songs, just five, but took two hours of stony jive. And Janice sings Peace in My Heart. Did you know that was written by Aretha's sister? and Mr. Sly Stone, and they all shout higher, and everyone's mortal soul is on fire. And then the Who at 5 a.m. tuned the day, and Roger sang as the sun rose over the celebration of the Woodstock Nation. And for one weekend, there was no war, no segregation, no violence, no conflagration, no alienation, just the Woodstock Nation, a celebration beyond imagination. Jefferson Airplane rocks in a flight. Amazing Grace says, good morning. It's a new day for sure. Then Joe Cocker and all of us made it with a little help from almost 500,000 friends of Joe Cocker and Country Joe and the crowd that roared like honeyed thunder and the thunder answered and the skies poured and everyone was under one another's wings taking care of each other. And then Jimmy played, and Gerardo drummed, and he drummed his conga and his corazón. And the day opened, and we all went home with a heart full of amazement and love, not to mention pride. I was 25. Now I'm 75. I'm still alive, and still amazed, and still a part of the Woodstock Nation, and unique combination of memory and awakening as the ground was shaking. The point I'm making is that the almost half a million of the Woodstock nation are fathers and mothers and grandmothers and grandfathers and sisters and brothers, and there's no taking that back, and that's a fact. So that was, uh, I, I literally started that on the plane, on a napkin, on my way here. Uh, that, so this is a, a never before, <laughs> and maybe a never again piece. Anyway, yeah. I am so happy to be here, and thank you to Peter and everybody who put this together. This is really amazing, and for all of you who came. So Woodstock was amazing. and. Uh, I like to tell you a little bit about how I got there, and it starts in the winter of 1968, where I was in the Florida Keys with Paul Krasner and Abby Hoffman and Abby's wife, Anita, and uh, we were there vacationing. And uh, the full story of that like, is in, in this book here, and they're selling those books out on the book table in front of the uh, auditorium, and after the show, I will go out there, and I've already signed a bunch of them, but I'll inscribe them for you, or I'll answer any questions you have about my presentation here. But anyway, so there we are in the Florida Keys, and we're rocking along, and we're taking acid, and we're swimming and everything, and one day we decided to go into Coconut Grove, because I thought maybe I could find Freddie Neal there, and we're looking around and we see this 
head shop, this beautiful head shop, and we go in, and one of the proprietors of this head shop is Michael Lang. And so we become friends, and I actually leave those guys uh, and, and, and stay with Michael Lang for a couple of days, and he takes me on a ATV over the beaches and everything, and th then I go back to New York, and I was just kind of a rookie journalist at the time, but over the next year, things kind of really exploded to me, and I started publishing in a lot of major markets, and um, comes the summer of 1969, and I had had a really bad week. I had three deadlines, and I was just so sleep deprived and tired that when the phone rang, I almost didn't answer it. But I picked it up, and it was somebody working for Michael Lang in the Woodstock office, the Woodstock um, Music and Art Fair office. And she said, Michael Lang wants to make sure you're coming. And I went like, Michael Lang, Michael Lang, Michael. Oh, oh, Michael Lang, yes. I said, please tell him, I, I don't think I can. First of all, I don't drive, and I don't have any transportation up there, and I'm just exhausted. She said, take a nap. We'll have somebody drive you. They'll be there tomorrow morning at 9. We'll, we'll, we'll find some people that are going from New York, and we'll, we'll get you right up there. And they'll be ringing your doorbell at 9, and you'll be there. So OK. So I went to sleep, and I managed to get up in time, and I got the ride. I, there are two guys, two journalists who work for the trades. I don't even remember who they were. I don't even think I thanked them. I slept all the way up there. I woke up, and we're coming into uh, the area, and there's all these people on on their lawns in chairs watching this incredible procession of cars. They'd never seen so much traffic in their lives, and they're going like this, and when, you know, the gets returned, they go like, you know, they were just so amazed. So we get there, um, the, the, they put me up at the Holiday Inn. That was another part of the bargain, because I didn't want to camp out. They, they got me a room at the Holiday Inn, and we get there. And, um, and so fine, and I'm packing in. It starts to rain and everything, and people start pouring in, and all the entertainers were staying at the Holiday Inn. And, uh, and, and we were then told that the festival had started, but nobody was going in except performers, because it was just too hard to get people in and out at this point. So I figured, OK. So uh, I was unpacking, maybe had a snack or something like that. And then an hour later came an announcement that the Jefferson Airplane were going into the festival to see what was happening with their old ladies. And their old ladies was code for whoever else wanted to come. So this big caravan leaves the Holiday Inn for the festival. And it's escorted by state troopers. And who's in the caravan but Augustus Stanley Owsley? Does anybody know who that was? That's the guy who manufactured and distributed most of the best lysergic acid <laughs> out of San Francisco that you could get. Anyway, so the, you know, right away I'm like, you know, there's the cops escorting Owsley into the festival. <laughs> So we come in through this road, and it's like a muddy road, and the, you know, some of the cars get stuck, and some of the hippies on the side of the road push the cars out. And we finally get to the festival area, and uh, it had only been on for about an hour, and Richie, but Richie Havens was still singing because they asked him to extend his set because nobody was there who could play after him. And uh, so we, we were there for a couple of hours through one rain shower and the next, and then we, we went back to the Holiday Inn, got a night's sleep, got up the next day, same thing, raining, too hard to get in, nobody's going in but entertainers. Well, that was, uh, that was something that nobody listened to anymore, so, and there was also discovered a different road to, to get in there. But until that could happen, while it was still raining, nobody particularly wanted to go, so everybody's down in the bar of the Holiday Inn. And they're playing Hey Jude on the jukebox, and people are singing Hey Jude, and Jerry Garcia's on the floor with Joan Baez, and they're trading licks, and there's you know all these people just drinking. And finally, the rain stops, and we go into the festival. And it's Saturday, and it's, it's really rocking. And we see canned heat. And, we, and Saturday night was just like a total pinnacle with, with, with everybody playing Janis Joplin. and. Um, Sly Stone, and it was just like being inside this amazing 
amazing beast. And it lasted all night and into the morning, into the next day. And uh, Shalana played. And it, it was amazing. Nobody, of course, had ever seen them before. So we didn't know. We watched these guys come on with their costumes. It's like, what are they going to do? And they got out like four bars, and everybody was just laughing their heads off, but in a, in a great way, because it was the irony of it, the peanut butter jelly sandwich of it. It was just so amazing, and they, they, were, they were so much fun. And you know, Rob, uh, I really enjoyed your lecture. I mean, obviously, the erudition has gone down a step, but, <laughs> but how many ways you have found to be an American hero, and I've got to believe that the seed of Woodstock was a part of that. So, was there a lasting effect of Woodstock? You're here, aren't you? <laughs> I mean, here we are 50 years later, and uh, people are still talking about it and celebrating it and having events around it and everything, which, which surprised me. Um, the first one, this is, I think, my fifth or sixth Woodstock uh, e event. The first one was uh, first week of June in New York City, where I met Gerard, Gerardo. And, um, uh, NYU did, did uh, an event. They had actually had a 10-week course on it that students took, and then the culmination was a lecture and a, and a panel. People are still interested in it and still talking about it. Well, so what was Woodstock? You know, it was a landmark of American culture, for sure. But I think it was also a landmark of American history in that it's kind of part of the emotional DNA of the country. And it, it, whatever people have become after Woodstock, I mean, you know, I, I turned into a poet, other people turned into lawyers and accountants and um, professors and whatever, there's still that seed there. There's still that seed in those almost half a million people that were there. And I think that it makes a difference. I don't know. But I'm a little old lady of 75. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. All right. That was fantastic, Ellen. Thank you so much. So, return to the music. And um, Crosby, Stills, and Nash hadn't yet released this song. Uh, it's a Stephen Stills masterpiece, really, written about his ex-girlfriend, Judy Collins. But CSN performed it live for the first time at Woodstock. It was, it was the first song, in fact, that they played there. And we're really fortunate tonight to have Ryan and Connor Ash to offer their take on it. So please put your hands together for Common Allies. So this is actually, this has been, uh, this is our second time uh, doing this here at DePaul. Um, I'm so sorry, I, I, I lost track of my DI. <laughs> but this is our second time doing this here at DePaul. The first time uh, we were here was a few years ago and we were actually uh, laughing with Anna because I was saying, oh, it was like just, like a, just a couple of years ago. It's like, no, it was three years ago. We were celebrating um, Sergeant Pepper's 50th anniversary. How the time does fly. Well, this song uh, holds, uh, we hold in very high regard because it's actually uh, one of the first songs that made us want to even start singing together. Instead of doing homework and all that fun stuff, you know. They, you know lots of college kids here, so they know, they know what it's like to procrastinate. <laughs> that was a little while ago for us. Wonderful, wonderful presentations here tonight. So I would like to actually uh, and please join me in applauding everybody who's been up so far to play and to speak. So tuning and plugging in the cables is it's not the song we promise.
Thank you. They're headed off to California tomorrow to make it big. We wish them good luck. Good luck, guys. Thanks for playing here tonight. So Janis Joplin's recording of Work Me Lord wouldn't come out uh, for another month until after Woodstock, but this tune by the great Nick uh, Gravenitzis was a showstopper back then, and here to stop our show tonight, accompanied on guitar by Derek E. Buckingham, please welcome Fallon Boyd. i 
that's how you do that. Wow. Oh, got one more musical act and one more speaker. Our final speaker for this evening is Gerardo Velez, and we are very pleased and honored to have him with us today. Gerardo's resume is probably one of the longest and most star-studded ones you could imagine for a contemporary musician. He's appeared as a percussionist on over 200 recordings with various other major celebrities in music. A partial list of those with whom he's toured and recorded includes David Bowie, Cool and the Gang, Aretha Franklin, Duran Duran, Elton John, Slash, Patti LaBelle, Stevie Wonder, Nile Rodgers and Chic, Natalie Cole, Mark Anthony, Jennifer Lopez, Paul Simon, Taylor Dane, Jessica Simpson, Destiny's Child, Shaka Khan, Stevie Nicks, and Kanye West. Honestly, Gerardo, you had me with Bowie. It stands to reason that you've heard Gerardo's work many times throughout your life which is why it makes sense now when you hear that he has three Amex Gold Reel Awards, six Gold and Platinum Recordings, and has been nominated for seven Grammys. I think I first came to know of his work in the early 80s incarnation of the jazz fusion band Spyro Gyra, which I saw in concert right before Gerardo left the group. I followed him over the years after that, excited when I would see him pop up, for instance, on David Letterman, including in one musical number with Paul Schaefer and Martin Shirt that I still show my undergrad students in class today. To see Gerardo slide into a conga beat and often with his eyes closed and his hands moving and possibly each in their own way, one gets the clear impression that this is what this man was born to do, that he's fulfilling what we call in philosophy his telos, all's right with the world. All of this is true, and all of this is already enough of a career worthy of a mic drop, but here's the kicker that I haven't even mentioned. On the weekend of his 22nd birthday, Gerardo played his first professional performance as a percussionist. For most of us, if we ever get that far as performers, it means finally getting paid for an open mic night. For Gerardo, it meant playing with perhaps the greatest guitarist in rock and roll history, Jimi Hendrix closing out Woodstock and cementing his place in history even without decades more accomplishments to come. Now that's the way you start a career. So please rhythmically put your hands together and welcome to the stage Gerardo Velez. Well, 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 well. I don't have any visuals to show you. I just have a lot of stories uh, from back in the day. I would also like to start, if I may, we want to turn on the lights and, and uh, put the lights on the conga for a minute. The congas. I want to start off with um, a song by my dear friend Richie Havens, who started the Woodstock uh, Festival. And Richie used to be in front of the Cafe Wa. Jimmy and I and all the guys used to go down there. And there's... Prior to that, actually, um, I used to see him uh, as a street musician. He didn't have any teeth in his mouth at that time, Richie Havens. Of course, once he got money, he got teeth, and that was fantastic. But he was, he was this is true, but he was an incredible, incredible guy, and you can tell by the depth and quality of his voice uh, that he has felt suffering and joy, and that really uh, showed itself through his music. So I'd like to go over to the Congas, if I may, and do a little song of his uh, for you. beginning for all my little Woodstock uh, seminars and lectures and talks. Freedom, talk about freedom, 
So you're probably wondering how I met Jimi Hendrix, and it's a story I like to tell. Uh, back in that time, I was a drug dealer, and uh, I had money, I had cars, I had girls, and I had drugs. And I was a musician, I was a dancer since I'm six years old, and I got my first pair of bongos at nine, and I lived in the South Bronx, which is a very tough neighborhood. It's called Fort Apache, the Bronx. My father had bodegas. So we, had, we, were, sir, we were a bit privileged uh, because I, my father had his stores and his business, and I went to prep schools. But the kids in my neighborhood, they didn't. My neighborhood at first was a beautiful Jewish neighborhood. I thought everybody in the world was Jewish and Puerto Rican at that time because that's uh, how I grew up. This is New York in the late 50s. It was a beautiful time, as he mentioned before. Peaceful, uh, innocent. Then, uh, then they wanted to draft me and, and take me to the war. And I said, I'm not going to war. My mother lost her brother in uh, World War II. And my mother says, you're not going to war. So she took me to school in Puerto Rico. And I got even more involved with drugs. Okay. Then I come out and I meet Jimmy. And I go to this place called Steve Paul Scene, and one of my best friends, his name is Kenny Rankin. Kenny Rankin was an incredible guitar player with one of the most beautiful voices you'll ever want to hear. Uh, and he wrote a song for me, which I'm very proud of. It's called Velez, which is my last name. And he talks about how we used to drive up and down Manhattan, from the Bronx down to Manhattan, and I'd have my congas and bongos and djembe, and he'd have his guitars. And I had a car, and I had my driver in the front, I had my bodyguard over here, and I would drive and play and go make these deals. And that's how I would live my life. It was carefree. I thought the world would always be that way. I first got involved with drugs with Timothy Leary uh, in, uh, wow, I forget the, the year right now, but we were the Sunshine Kids. And uh, we dropped acid, and they would observe us. We didn't know. It was a, an apartment at the top of the Carnegie, uh, Carnegie Hall. And there's apartments above Carnegie Hall, and I used to go up there. So I'm, I'm giving you a little understanding of what New York was about, what was going on. I was also in the Young Lords, and we were fighting for the rights. We were fighting for women's rights. We were fighting for the ERA. We were fighting for women to control their own bodies. We were fighting for religious freedom, ethnic freedom. We were fighting for civil rights, okay? Now, what happened at that time, there was a lot of turmoil going on, and the only thing that was saving us all was our music, because there wasn't much. Not like today, there was very limited communication. You lived regionally. You didn't live in the world. You lived within your region, within your locale, and that's how life was, as most of you here tonight may have uh, experienced in your past. Okay, so 
Years later, there I am, I'm rocking, I, I'm a you know, smart kid, wise ass, I should say, kid. And I go to meet uh, Steve Paul's scene, which you mentioned before. Steve Paul was the manager of Johnny Winters. And I was with Jimmy at uh, it was Fillmore, and he was in the front row, and he said, hey, uh, this is how relaxed it used to be. Jimmy was on stage, and he goes, hey, Jimmy, I want you to meet this guy from Texas, an incredible guitar player. His name is Johnny Winters. And, and Jimmy went, oh, man, nice to meet you, man. It's a pleasure to meet you. That's how it was back in the day. We would jam and hang out and just have a great old time. So I go to Steve Paul C with, with my little entourage, and I go up and I play with Jeff Beck, and who was an incredible guitar player, you may know, and uh, Rick Derringer, who was in um, the McCoys, Hang On Sloopy, Sloopy Hang, and it's a huge hit, which is now the, uh, actually the song of Ohio State, okay? And they play it at every Ohio State football game, okay? And if they knew the real reason that song was made, they'd never, they never would play it. But that's rock and roll. Uh, yeah, you know, and, and that's the way it is. I mean, I'm, I'll tell you a story, even with my group Spira Gyro. We had hits after hits, and I'm going, man, this is great. And then one day we get into an elevator, and I hear our music uh, on Muzak on the elevator, and the guys are going, wow, this is great. We're, listen to this, we're on music. I said, we are dead. We are now irrelevant. We are irrelevant. We are part of the mainstream because we're on Muzak. And a few years later, the music turned a corner because that's what music does, as does time and as does history. So I finished playing with Jeff Beck and, uh, and, and Rick. And Rick had his band. Rick was like 16, 17. Uh, you know, when I met Jimmy, I was 19 going on 20. And... Um, so uh, then I went back to my seat, I sat down, a guy taps me on the back of the shoulder and he says, hey man, that was some really great playing, man. Dude, you wanna come up and play with me, man? And I said, I, tur I turned around and my, I turned around, I looked at him. Now for me, I'm a percussionist, right? I play acoustic instruments and he was loud. His instrumentation was loud. I said, all right, let's go jam, you know? And my friends would go, wow, that's Jimi Hendrix, that's Jimi Hendrix. But you know, when you're 20 years old, you have your own destiny. It was about me, it wasn't about Jimmy. It was about me and what I wanted to do, and I thought my destiny was coming, and he may be part of it. So we went up and we jammed, and it was Jeff Peck and Jimmy, myself, and a bunch of guys. And Jimmy, was, he was such a cool guy. He was such a gentleman and uh, an observer. He was more of an observer than uh, a person. I was the guy who went up and got the parties going and got everybody happening and got the energy and brought everything, and he was the cool guy, you know, that had a lot going on and, 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 and had his pad and was always writing down poetry or lyrics for a new song. And you know, we all carried our pads. We all had that, you know, this little bag that we would carry with our new life. Our new life was in this bag. So um, we jammed and, and Jeff Beck was going beer, beer, in Jimmy's face and Jimmy was like because he was such a fluid and beautiful player. His hands were this long, and his fingers could play, he could play the lead and the rhythm at the same time, and kick in the bass at the same time. That's what fooled so many people. He also played the left-handed upside guitar. Now, I'm left-handed as well, and one of, the, one of the things we would sit down and talk about all the time was how difficult it is to be a left-handed person in a right-handed world. Everything that we have to do we have to learn a slight bit different, well, a lot differently than a right-handed person. And here's a statistic for you. Over 2,500 people die a year, lefties die a year by using right-handed equipment. Okay, I digress, but that's another story. So uh, I meet, you know, after we played, I sat down, Jimmy sat down behind me, he said, man, that's great, let's go to the studio and jam. I said, all right. So we went to the studio and we jammed for 10 hours. And then I came back the next night, and, and we jammed again. And I said, uh, so I was in the lounge having a cigarette. Everybody smoked back then. And he comes into the lounge. I said, Jimmy, what do you think? What is this all about? Because Buddy Miles was there, and uh, Stephen Stills would come in, and all these guys would come in. And I said, where are you going? He says, well, I'm doing something different. And I'm going to break up the experience. And I'm bringing my buddies from uh, my, buddy, my buddy Billy Cox and my other buddy Larry Lee from the Armed Forces. And I want to try something different. I want to add a rhythm guitar player with Larry, and you on percussion, and then eventually some other parts. And then we added Juma Sultan on, on uh, African percussion on the other side, because Michael Jeffries, Jimmy's manager, said, 
who is this kid Jerry Velez? He's a nobody. And Jimmy says, I love the way he plays. He's staying in the group. He was in another room talk. They were in the other room talking. My, and Michael Jeffries supposedly was part of British intelligence, uh, a lot of people had said. And Reprise Records was really a front because we were spying on Britain. Britain was spying on us. Everybody was spying on everyone. And he was a very dark individual. And he really controlled Jimmy's life and Jimmy's career. And he owed Jimmy over three and a half million dollars. And that's a lot of money now. And it was a lot of, I mean, it's a lot of money back then. And it would be, you know, I don't know how many millions today, but it's a lot. So uh, Michael said, listen, I don't, I, I don't want this to happen. And Jimmy says, this is what I'm doing. So we went, uh, uh, Jimmy got a house up in Woodstock. And we went up to the house. And we just hung out. And uh, there were horses. There was a lake on the property. It was in Boiseville, New York. It was about a half hour out of Woodstock. And I lived in Woodstock before because my sister, Martha Velez, uh, was in the original cast of Hair and with Diane Keaton and all these other people at that time. And uh, so when my sister got her record deal with Sire Records through Seymour Stein, Sire Records eventually had Talking Heads and Madonna and all these different acts, and it became a real a, a super boutique label within the industry. And Sire signed my sister on her first album, uh, Mitch Midgel, Brian Auger, Eric Clapton, all the best from England were on it. On her third album, it was produced by Barb Marley. It's called Escape from Babylon. It's his only non-Jamaican production is Martha Velez. So they all lived in Woodstock, and I, I moved up there as well. And Bob Dylan lived right up the road. We lived on a, what was called Lower Bird Cliff, and he lived at the very top of, Bird, uh, of that road. And when we would jam in the house, he'd come and sit on the porch. He'd never come in and get involved. Bob was never like that. And uh, uh, the electric flag was in town. Uh, oh, God, there were so many groups that lived in Woodstock at that time because we wanted to leave the city. We wanted to leave the establishment and go up to the country. I mean, can he go to the country? Lord, get away. How go into the... It's happy. It's, it's a release. It's like we're tired of what's, what our parents have established. We want to do something new. We want to break ground. Now, how do you break ground when you're a young kid you have to do it by gathering the troops, right? That's what we do now on the internet. You create your own tribe, okay? But back then, it was word of mouth, and uh, it traveled. And that was a beautiful thing, how those things traveled. People actually communicated back then all the time. There, weren't any, there wasn't any distractions like we have today. It was all about communication. It was all about interacting. It was all about we. Not I, but we. So. Um, we went up to Boiseville and we started to record and, uh, and hang out. And uh, Jimmy had these two big uh, um, trunks, these steamer trunks filled with records. And um, we had this room filled with equipment. Eric Clapton came over, uh, Jack came over, uh, Stephen Stills came. All these guys would come over and jam with us. You know, J uh, Janice came over a bunch of times. Uh, you know, just, it was, it was a breeding ground for music, and everybody was looking at Jimmy's style and trying to copy his style. And uh, we'd go into the trunk, and he'd say, okay, pick a record, and I'd cl close my eyes like this. I'd cover my eyes, right, I'm going for a record here, and I'd pull out a record, and that record would, whatever it was, we would sit and play to it. And we really became good buddies and, you know, hung out and really talked and dreamt together because uh, we were like the odd men out. He was a black guy in a a white uh, area in, in uh, Seattle, and I'm a Puerto Rican boy who grew up with white people all the time, and we had similar understanding of how to be the odd man out, how to blend, and how to stand out as well. Jimmy is, is, is a black American who is iconic. No, I mean, I go to uh, white uh, rock and roll shows, and they don't like black people at all, and when anything with Jimmy happens, Jimi Hendrix happens, they're all over it. He had no color, and it just, I just don't understand how these things are possible today, but they are. Now, from there, we kept on playing, and uh, we kept on hearing about this show, and Jimmy says, okay, let's do this show that's coming up. Now, don't forget, we were hearing things on the radio, and that was really the only form of communication other than, you know, telephones, and there weren't really great telephone systems up in, in that area at that time, so it was really, you know, going back to New York, and driving back to New York and driving back up. 
So I would go, uh, um, so we heard about the concert, and Larry Lee and Billy came, and we rehearsed, and then Mitch Mitchell came, and we were really excited, and then the, the, the concert happened, and well, prior we heard on the radio, oh my God, listen, all these people are coming. Wow, this, that, and the other, okay, they shut down the highways. We said, wow, this is it. We have really done it. We have made a mark. We are making some kind of change. I got so excited that uh, at that, you know, it was, my birthday was coming up, right? August 15th is my birthday, and prior to that, we were, you know, doing, getting up, building up to the, the event. So, uh, the, so the roads were closed, so there was a back road that people didn't know about that they took, a, first they brought us in a helicopter to a certain area, and then they drove us in a limo over to Yasger's house, you know, and we had this big house on the concert grounds, and it was Yasger's. And, um, you know, the, po the, the event continued to get postponed and continued to get postponed. And we would drop drugs. He said, okay, you guys ready to go on? Oh, yeah. We'd take all this stuff. And then all of a sudden, okay, you guys have to wait three more hours. We did that three times. Yeah, three times. And then we went up and we were melting on stage. We were melting on stage. Uh, but it was a very unique experience uh, to go there every day. I went every day. Oh, I went uh, from the very beginning, because obviously it was my birthday. I was down in New York for the Black Woodstock, if you guys don't know. There was an incredible event in Harlem at the time where Sly and the Family Stone, and Patti LaBelle, and all these incredible artists were performing, and no one really knows about that, but there's a movie coming out. I'm at the Jazz Foundation in New York, and we have a movie coming out about that. I, I was down there hanging out, and then I rushed up to Woodstock, because I was, you know, dancing, having a good time with the folk, and um, went up to Woodstock, and then Jimmy, you know, uh, he was at the house practicing, and prior to that, oh, I want to tell you, okay, so prior to that, we're in the house, and he starts messing around with the Star Spangled Banner, right? So I said, Jimmy, I said, we're the counterculture. I said, why do you want to do the Star Spangled Banner? Come up with something original. Let's do, let's do some, I don't know, I'm a, praise America, but let's do it in another fashion that we're not, you know, that we create. And he said, I don't think so. For, you know, he would always entertain my ideas. That's why he was such a cool guy. Like, I came up with Gypsy Sun and Rainbows. I came up with that name. I said, let's call ourselves Gypsy Sun and Rainbows. How groovy is that? So we, because we were so groovy at that time, of course. And, uh, so he said, I like it, I like it, I like it, Chi. And he said, I like, but I also like band of gypsies. I said, but we're not gypsies, you know. He said, yeah, but, you know, it's a, it's a vibe, G, it's a vibe. And I said, okay. Um, so if you notice in the show, we argued over that. We argued over the Star Spangled Banner because we had that kind of relationship. You know, if you see me on stage, you'll see I didn't, you know, I wasn't scared. I didn't give a crap. I was dancing, I was doing my thing. Why? Because that's my destiny. And people say, why were you there? I said, because I was supposed to be there and I was worth it to be there. Everyone should recognize their own worth and find whatever they can do that they feel, I can do this really well. And that's what I could do really well back then. So, um, and one thing that Jimmy said to me when we were jamming afterwards, uh, he said, man, you're a really great jammer and uh, you know, you jam just as well as I do, bro, I gotta say. And I said, why else would you have me? Why would you have me in your group if I wasn't good enough to play with you? So, uh, you know, believe me, I'm much more humble now than I was then, okay? <laughs> Life has shown me how to be humble, right? How to eat crow and the gristle, and I've had, egg, I've had egg all over my face in very, very many occasions that I'd rather not discuss right now. But at that time, we thought we were invincible, and uh, perhaps we were, uh, as far as uh, our place in history. Uh, like I said, it was my first professional gig, so I didn't have any, you know, I would jam with a lot of people and sit in like I did with, you know, with the other guys, uh, with um, Rick Derringer and uh, McCoy's and all these other bands that I was in, but I never really had, I never got paid for it because I always had all my own money and, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't about that for me. And Jimmy was the first guy, he always carried $10,000 in a bag on his, on his side, and he would pay me $1,000 a week. $1,000 a week in 1968 is a lot of money. But I was making more than that. It wasn't about the money, it was about 
the camaraderie and the love that he gave me. He made sure that the money was in my pocket regardless of anything, and he made sure that I was taken care of, and he made sure at Woodstock, if you look at the video, uh, the movie, excuse me, if you look at the movie and you see Jimmy says, hey, we're Gypsy Sun and Rainbows, just a band of gypsies, and he turns and he looks at me. And in other words, to say, I did it, G, you got it, you know? That's the kind of guy he was. He was a loving brother and a wonderful guy. And we were, in the, we were up in the house, and every day I would be going down in the limo and going to see all the various acts that were happening uh, at the concert ground. In town, people were performing. I saw Santana playing at a small little place called the Tinker Street Cafe that was on the main street as Tinker Street in the town of Woodstock. I lived in Bearsville. I had a house in Bearsville at that time on Tinker Street. And, but I was staying with Jimmy up at his house, and we're driving by Tinker Street, and we lower the, the, the window in the limo, and I hear all this Latin music coming out of the Tinker Street Cafe, and I said, wow, what's going on? Let's pull over. So we pulled over, and uh, we went in there, and I heard, oh, yeah, go on, uh, me and he and mo. And I said, wait a minute, wait a minute, that's Tito Puente. You know, that's that Tito Puente song. And, and, uh, and, uh, and then the other one was a, a Fleetwood Mac song. Uh, uh, Black Magic Woman. I don't know if you've ever heard the, their version, but it's completely different than Santana's version. I love Santana's version better. And so does Mick Fleetwood, who's a buddy of mine who I played with um, a couple of years ago. So uh, we uh, then, uh, we were at the concert grounds, and I would go in the limo, and I would go down and get some friends, and come on back up, and, you know, some different, I'd take people back down, i get, you know, Okay, come on, bring us some girls. I go down and get some girls. Yo, 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 you want to come up? Yeah, we all come. It was a time of free love. I don't know what you know. You think about that now. But we were experimenting with one another uh, physically, spiritually, and emotionally because it was a, a, a pivotal time. It was a, as it is today. Today is a very pivotal time. Let's be aware. You know, we fought hard. I, I mean, I, I got my ass kicked because I would go out and pick it. And I, mean, I was 90 pounds soaking wet. And it didn't matter to me. It was about, we were all driven. And when I see young people today driven because of what's going on, I am so proud of our youth and, uh, and, and behind them because it's their time. We, we tried. We did the best that we could. Uh, didn't turn out all that great in certain, certain areas, but we established a moral code, I believe. And the moral code has been taken away from the world right now. And, and, and we need to get that again. We need to readjust to who we were. And Jimmy and I talked about it. If you listen to some of the music that he wrote, and when he did Machine Gun, when we were working on Machine Gun with, 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 with Buddy, um, you know, it was all about that because I, I avoided the draft because I got arrested. You know, I got arrested nine times. I went to prison for life. Um, uh, under the Rockefeller law in New York State, I, I had 15 years to life, three 15 year to life sentences. I had a very uh, misspent youth, but I uh, came out of it all right. Um, I went to prison, I went to Attica, and then uh, I came, I, I had to relocate, and I relocated to Buffalo, New York. And I was lucky enough to meet some guys there, and we started a group called Spira Gyra, which I'm more proud of than playing with Jimi Hendrix, because that's something that I actually had a part in and I'm very proud of. We're the best-selling contemporary jazz group of all time. We have 14, I have seven Grammy nominations. They have 14 altogether. And to me, that uh, is the, is, I could die tomorrow and I say, okay, I did what I wanted to do, but now I, I feel like it's time, I'm reinvigorated with what's going on now, with the new music that's going on right now. For people my age that are singing in this audience, you gotta understand, every generation needs their heroes. We had ours, and they need theirs. So, and Jimmy and I would talk about it, we'd write songs. I mean, we lived in this house, and there were two main bedrooms, and I was the first one there. I said, okay, that's gonna be Jimmy, because that's larger, and this is gonna be mine. You know how you go in with a bunch of guys or girls, and say, oh, let's go, get our rooms and chase down the room. So I had that room, and we had this big bathroom in between us with two huge sinks, and I'd wake him up, he, or he'd wake me up, and we'd you know, go in there, and we'd start singing songs, and we'd make songs about wheat checks, and we'd make songs about apple pies, and you know, just having a, a, a great old time. That was the spirit of Woodstock, being able to communicate with one another, and when you got all those people together and nothing violent happened, I came from such a, a violent 
uh, uh, environment in New York City, to then go to this peaceful environment, I immediately ran out there. I threw off my clothes. I dove into the water. I felt, oh my God, this is incredible. This, 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 this feel. I, I, you know, and I didn't think about this for so, so many years, you know. And I've, I've never talked about my prison situation uh, up until now because uh, it's something that it's, it's a catharsis for me. But no one, know, you know, my musical career, I never mentioned that, and I was very, you know, I was very saddened and, uh, uh, you know, disappointed in myself and my past, but the past is the past, and, you know, I went on to a lot of things. And if Jimmy would be around, people say, what would Jimmy be like? I said, he was an explorer. And when I take a Jimi Hendrix song, I completely turn it around. I do my version of his song because he would love that. And we would do a song or something like that. He'd go, Jimmy, come here, check this out. And I'd have an idea, and he'd go, I like that. Or, you know, or he would squash it. He was the consummate musician. We went into the studio, and he could play the drums, the keyboards, uh, um, guitar, obviously, the bass, and an engineer. So when you went into the studio, he would get in a stream of consciousness, and you, consciousness, and you just had to kind of step back and watch him do his thing. And then he'd get behind the console, and he played the bass on most of those albums. And he didn't play the drums, Mitch played on them, and then Buddy, but he played the bass on most. And then Billy played when Billy came into, into the arena. I went to see Jimmy uh, at the Navarro Hotel, which is in Manhattan, and uh, at the Navarro, and I said, Jimmy, you know, what, what's the next phase for us? He says, well, I'm contracted to do a series of shows uh, with the trio. And uh, so I'm going to go do shows with the trio. I said, wow, that's great. I said, wow, I wonder what I'm going to do. And uh, that's when, you know, a lot of problems happen for me. But, I, you know, life changes. So to me, what the, the energy of uh, Woodstock, the vibe of Woodstock, you know, you, sh you, you should have been there. It, it, was, it was great. You would have really enjoyed it. Uh, it was a very unique situation. It'll never happen again. Every Woodstock after that was totally dysfunctional like the first. Even this year when, you know, we were going to do this here, we were going to do it there. The, you know, it was a big mishmash, just like the original, unfortunately. And now, you know, let's, let's not discuss Woodstock in the sense of, like, nostalgia. Let's look at Woodstock as a, a foundation for young people today to, you know, to, to pick up uh, we're kind of like where we left off because the same problems are happening today. Um, and I wrote a song about that, which I'll sing for you right now. You read it every day. They're dying for the truth. I wonder how we've come so far with all our self-abuse. Oh, people being bought and people being sold. Everywhere you look, an ugly story unfolds. No news is good news. I'd rather turn my back. Oh, I'm tired of the blues. Ba -ba -da -ba. No news. Here's good news, I'll keep it to yourself. I've had enough abuse, incurable disease. The Middle East at war, crooked politicians, a pop as at our door, oh. Then we read by Johnny, the local paper boy, of how he went and took his life. A gun is not a toy, no news is good news. I'd rather turn my back. I'm tired of the news, no news, here's good news, I'll keep it to yourself, I've had enough abuse, I'm waiting for the day, mm -hmm, yeah, when the headlines say, no more hunger, no more wars, the world will be free of pain, oh, maybe I'm just dreaming, but all that I can do is dream and try to make it better, yeah. But until that day, ha, 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 I say no news is good news. I'd rather turn my back. Oh, I'm tired 
of the news. And everything I just sang there, it's the same. Nothing has changed. You can call it, maybe we don't call it apartheid, but it is racism. Maybe we don't call this by those names back then, but it is happening today. So we all have to get, get together in the spirit of Woodstock. And I want to thank you all for listening to me ramble here today. And Peter, let's, let's give it up for this gentleman here who put this together and his entire group. Thank you so much. It's without a doubt the most rock and roll lecture that's ever been given at this lectern. So to close us out tonight with that ironic postmodern moment but heartfelt moment, uh, a song that was originally played by Gerardo's old bandmate, Jimi Hendrix, please join me in welcoming from the band's slight return, Mark Cassa. <laughs> We got one last surprise for y'all. If you can stick around for a couple extra minutes, we thought we'd put together a big finale for you. So I'm going to invite everybody who played tonight to come up and get their instruments. We uh, thought we would end with a song and have a final jam together. Anybody who played tonight, anybody who lectured is welcome to come up as well. We hope you might want to sing along, even get up and dance if you want. 